work and student teaching. Maybe you came through the side door. This wasn't your first choice for a career, but you're here now in person or online, not only helping your kids, oops, your candidates, but also helping those candidates reach children in their own classrooms someday really soon. The work is long and difficult. There are moments of supreme joy and deep despair. Sometimes you feel supported and sometimes maybe not so much, but you are here, you are still here, and I'm glad you're here today at DARTEP, an organization unlike anywhere else in this country where EPPs and MDEs work together to improve teacher education and make a better place for children, those children that you believe in. So now I would like to welcome Barbara baird Polly from Spring Arbor to come and say a few words. Would you welcome her with your applause? I hate standing behind. First of all, welcome. Uh, we are so appreciative of our long journey to get here today. And more importantly, that you have made the trip down here. Uh, when last spring they indicated that they were looking for an October host, I said, well, of course we'll do it. And so we appreciate that you reached out, Marsha, and that we are here today being able to do this. It was rather interesting watching people come in. It was kind of like going to church on Sunday. Everybody wanted to sit in the back. <laughs> and so, again, we appreciate, um, you know, it's a finite amount of space and that everybody is here we've got great numbers and i think you'll be happy with the food etc through the day spring arbor has a very rich history and part of that history is the school of education it has been the mainstay and continues to be the mainstay of this institution even though we are growing uh, with an engineering program growing with nursing programs and for a university of our size to be able to share that we have at least one and we're approaching a second doctorate program of a university of this size. Just a little bit of history, and then I'm going to walk you through some of the logistics pieces. Spring Harbor University started out as a seminary. Not as we understand seminaries to be in this day and age, but it started out as a seminary. It transitioned to being served as a high school, Spring Harbor High School. In fact, the School of Education building here was the original Spring Harbor High School. From that, it became a community college. From that, it transitioned to being a college. In 1994, transitioned to being university status, which is something that Spring Harbor has taken a great deal of pride in and humility in with respect to preserving what it is that takes to have that university status. Through every step of the way, the priority has been educating young men and women and educating young men and women to lead the next generation, in our case, of teachers. I came here a few couple of years back after serving as a high school principal. And this just, this warms my heart. This is like the cafeteria. You can't walk between the chairs very well because all the stuff is out. And you think you're gonna trip over somebody or something. But I came here to Spring Arbor because I was told the rich history of serving education. And it has been a phenomenal transition. I loved what I did every day. Do not confuse that with every minute of every day. <laughs> and to transition here now to be able to work with the next generation of educators is phenomenal. And we are really working hard here to grow programs. We are working right now with the MDE on our approval for our leadership masters. My next goal beyond that is to get a doctorate in that leadership. 
and to bring back our PE health program. Because what I'm finding after working with student teachers, and we do have an aging population of PE teachers, that a lot of them said, if you had PE health, you would have majored. I went into English because I just wanted to be a teacher. And well, that's beautiful. The PE and health is where your heart is at. We need to be listening to you. And so student voice is really important here. I do want to take a moment to thank some people, and I don't usually read from something, but I was afraid I'd look or uh, miss somebody. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to host this today. It is our privilege and our honor to be able to do that. For Brian, who has been a great communicator, not only with us, but with our tech people, and as most of you probably experienced, we do not have a plethora of staff. And so to our students who are here being our IT support today, who are doing their very, very best to make sure that we have what we need. And Brian, I appreciate that you met with them early and to ensure that everything is as it should be. To our food service, who has provided our breakfast layout, they will also be preparing our lunch layout. Again, to our IT people, our student workers, as you were coming in, we had student workers strategically placed. Uh, I happen to be that person who could get lost in the box. And sometimes when we are hosting things, we think our directions are so clear. And so for our student workers who made themselves available around their class structure to be able to make sure that we could get to uh, this destination. And also to Heather Hoskins, who is our administrative assistant in our office. Uh, I jokingly tell her if I were doing these centerpieces, they'd probably be in lined up squares or rectangles. And Heather just has a, a gift. And so Heather, thank you for your work, being here early, making sure things were set up and the centerpieces are beautiful. So thank you. Logistics. Many of you probably in the next five to 10 minutes are gonna be wondering where the heck are the restrooms? And so when you step out of these two doors, you'll go left, you hit a rail, you'll go left. The men's room is the first door, the ladies room is the last door. When we break up into sessions, the deans and directors are going to be meeting outside of this room, which again will be between or through the uh, doors, down a set of steps and on your left, it's called the Willow Room. The other breakout groups will meet right in here. And I believe that we certainly have adequate space to be able to do that. But again, I just say thank you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, we appreciate the ability to meet collectively. This is my second year as Dean and I'm still learning. And I learn a tremendous amount every time we have a DARTA meeting. And I don't always know the questions to ask because I'm still figuring and navigating uh, in the next year or so, it'll become much more of a natural. So I appreciate the support that you lend. And again, the opportunity to host you today. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you, Barbara. What a pleasant person. I'd like to be in her class. Um, I think the next thing we need to do is to reintroduce our NARTEP board for this year. And um, I've already introduced myself, but uh, Stein, Brunbog with uh, University of Michigan Dearborn is our secretary, and that means chair elect. And he said this morning, Oh, those go together, don't they? And, it's like, yeah. and Beth, uh, so Stein, would you stand up? Beth, would you stand up? Beth Felton from Oakland is our treasurer. And the man with all the tech support and our very faithful guru, Brian. Thank you very much. Now let's take a moment and get to know you. We're not going to go person by person. Whoops. Uh, somebody changed it for me. How do I get back? I did the wrong thing. Wait, you fix it. <laughs> you talk, I'll advance. All right, great. So, um, no, I need the back one. The one back. You want to go back? I want to go back. There we go. Um, so we have people, if you're, if the institution is starred, they are online, but everybody else 
should have at least one representative here in person. And what yeah, I'd like you to do is your whole team stand up when your name when your team is called. And uh, if there's anybody new to DARTEP, if you'd please introduce that person. So starting at the top up alphabetically, because I am the teacher. Adrian, where are you? Okay. <laughs> Maybe they're online. Albion. Yay. Anybody new? Okay, great. Alma. We're here. Okay. Uh, Aquinas. These folks came all the way from the other side of the state. Wow. Uh, Calvin. There we are. So did Calvin. That's right. Central. Where are you? Ah, beautiful. Nobody new? Okay. Easter. EMU new. You have a new person. We have we have two new people. So uh Sandy Krieger started in July. So Sandy's our new field placement. I'm going to mess up whatever the official title yeah, is. That's new person. But Sandy is recently retired from Ann Arbor Public Schools, and so we love having her in the office. Our other new person here is Elle Whitaker. Elle's our new data person in computer education. So welcome to Dr. Ted. Uh, Ferris, in the back, there we are. Anybody new? Um, this is Steffi. He is our uh, off-site um, field placement coordinator and advisor. Great. Welcome, Jeff. Grand Valley. GVU, anybody new? No. Nope. Hope. Okay. Uh, Madonna. Yay, Madonna. There you are. Anybody new? We have the new um, field placement coordinator, Victor Bowman, here is by H. And Rush here, and this is our new director of student teaching. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Michigan State. Welcome. MDE. I know you're going to introduce your new people later, but if you just all stand up and say hi. All, all over the place. Yeah, there we go. All right. Northern. That's a long haul there on mine. Uh, Oakland. Yeah. Uh, Rochester. Nope, they're on one too. Sorry. Saginaw Valley. All right. And Emily. Emily is new. Welcome, Emily. Um, Sienna Heights. Yep. We have somebody new. This is Hal and she He is our clinical field work coordinator and administrative assistant. Well, that's a young man carrying a lot. Spring Arbor. There we are. And you all said hi already. <laughs> you have been uh, Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Spence. All of you have been people. <laughs> Yay. Anybody new to introduce? Yeah, I'm new. I'm Liz Cunningham. I'm the campus chair of the OD department. Oh, okay. Good chair. I'm new. I'm Kate Mendoza Oh, I work in the EPP program at uh, Ann Arbor UNM campus. I just started in August. And I'm Tony Smith, program manager of Enmark and from Ann Arbor Division. Great. Thank you very much. Wayne Say. Where are you, Wayne? There we are. And Western. I can say oh, uh, sure. You've got somebody. Right here. Nisha Patel is our new assistant dean of computer education. Oh, welcome. And Western. We have two new people, and I'm just going to hand off my <laughs> I'm Michelle Snyder. I'm on Instagram Monday as the director of Fellow Experiences. I'm Morgan Quinn. I'm also in the Fellow Experiences office. Thank you very much. And, ah, we have somebody else. My apologies. I was going from a, a, a list of those who responded and it must have been harvested too soon. Yeah. I'm the Dean of Education and Human Services at Cornerstone. And then Judy Salter is our new certification officer. Excellent. Thank you. Did, did I miss anybody else? 
Oh, I missed somebody. Must have been the C's. Oh, my God. Sam Price is going to kill me. That agrees to be at Concordia, so that's why I know that. All right. Great. Let's go on to business. I guess now we get down to business. So um, we're going to call. Uh, uh, first of all, the minutes were sent out, and we need to find out if we approve those minutes. So is there a motion to approve minutes? Sally Ray has, has moved. Stein is writing these things down. I'm in a second because I know how to spell my name. Okay. <laughs> All in favor of approval of those minutes, please say aye. Aye. Anybody that doesn't like the minutes? <laughs> okay, that has passed. Um, there's a slide here that says annual change of leadership. And I'm not sure what that's about. Somebody else put that slide in the deck. Oh, we just, I'm sorry, just left that in from last year. If you hadn't already taken an opportunity to talk about. All right, great. So we did, we did that. Um, so now we're on to the budget report. So I think Beth comes up for the budget report. Are we go back a couple? Yeah. There we go. So Beth. All right. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you all in person. It's always uh, exciting when you get to be in the same space with each other. So I really appreciate you taking a drive this morning. Hopefully, I'm hoping your drive is as lovely as mine was right across the state. Um, so this year for 23-24, our dues are remaining the same. They're remaining at $50 per member. Um, we have a new way to pay. So the old way we were paying had two problems with it. One was the amount of fees that we were paying. And the other was that um, Oakland University didn't want to be responsible for the PCI insurance, which is, if you're a finance person, you know a lot more about than I, I do, but credit card information being stored on a university computer, they wouldn't allow. DARTEP also doesn't want to carry that liability. And so we've now switched to Square. And so right on our DARTEP website, and there, that is a hot link, right on our website now is a little button that says pay here and you go in and you do it yourself. And so I don't have to be involved in that process. I just look on the back end of the reports that come in from Square. If you don't want to use Square and you don't want to use a credit card, you can still pay by check. You're just going to send that to me at Oakland. If you don't have my address, you're welcome to shoot me an email and I can get that sent off to you. Um, just a reminder, I sometimes get emails saying, hey, we have a new member, please add them to the list. Um, Brian does the listserv for DARTEP. I only have the people that are paid members, and you might think those are the same, but they're not. Anyone can join our listserv, but then we have a separate list of paid members. So just a quick reminder for you. So um, these are the institutions that have registered members as of the date I called it, just like you were saying, Diane, you might have missed a couple. Um, but these are the ones that registered members. What's interesting is some of you registered members and didn't pay, and some of you paid and didn't register members. Um, I'm doing my best to rectify that list. Um, so, and I know sometimes it the right people have to answer the emails and everything. So um, these are the people that have registered new members. It's not necessarily the same as those that pay. So if the person at your institution has any questions, they're welcome to email me and we will get that taken care of. Um, we're going to have dark chat here. This is something new. So um, we were talking as an executive board and we decided we wanted to do something kind of cool for dark chat. And so, Men and ladies have options for a quarter zip sweatshirt. Diane is holding one up. I have a, it doesn't have the DARTEP logo, but it will have our logo on it. Um, I have a small, medium, large, extra large, and 2XL in women's and men's. So at some point of today, you can come up and look. The women's are here on the side Diane was on. These are the men's. You're welcome to slip them on to see what size you wear. Um, they're about $40. DARTEP is going to take care of half of it for people that are paid members. And then we got an offer from Coke. You want to talk about that just quickly, Stein? Sure. Yeah. Are those going to be ordered or purchased today? Ordered. Okay. And not even today, I'll send a form. 
So, uh, if you're not familiar with folks, consortium for outstanding achievement and teaching of technology, and it's somewhat uh, defunct. Um, and so, but we still have some money uh, sitting around doing nothing but collecting dust in an account. So, I talked to Beth back in uh, April at Hope uh, Accreditation Conference and said, can we move this money over uh, to DARTA and use it for something meaningful? And this this idea came up, we can use some of that money to cover the other app for paid members. So um, anybody who's a paid member can order one of these wonderful items and we'll cover the cost. So if that's not an incentive to get your boost in, I don't know what it is. And if there are other colleagues who are not paying members that want to get a shirt, they can buy them at full price, you know, $40. So um, again, we just thought that would be something fun. I will send out a Google form. I will ask for your name and size, and then I will bring them all to our December meeting, which is Sienna Heights. Yes. Yes. Sienna Heights. I will bring them there and I'll send it home with one of your colleagues if you are not present. Okay. Next slide. So at the end of September, this is our balance. Um, outstanding, we still of course have dues to collect right now. Um, Spring Arbor graciously covered the cost of breakfast this morning. So again, thank you very much to Spring Arbor. Darta will be covering our lunch expenses today. So that will be some outgoing money. Um, and we will be transferring the money from the Coke account that Stein just talked about into the Darta account. So um, financially, we are pretty secure. Uh, for those of you new to Darta, this money is used for things like the technology to run these meetings and have it available over Zoom. It's used for paying for conferences, sometimes locations, sometimes food, um, and other things that might come up. Um, so far, I have dues from nine different institutions. So again, it doesn't quite line up with that list, but that's okay. We know we'll, we'll get it going. So that's it from the treasurer's report, unless any of you have questions. Fabulous. Have a great day. Thank you, Beth. All right. So let's hear from our fabulous organizations. Sally Ray, come up to the mic. Hey, everybody. Kind of great to see you all. Um, some of you, the good news is that I see a whole lot of faces this morning that I don't have a clue who you are. <laughs> and that's the bad news for me because I don't have a clue who you are. Um, I am the past president of, Mac of MACTI. That's the Michigan Association for Colleges of Future Education. Um, we are kind of considered the workhorse. Um, we've defined it in years past as DARTEP is the the grounded, the solid information, you're gonna get the real information about what's going on in the state of Michigan. <clears throat> and when it comes down to um, where the rubber hits the road, sometimes it's MACD that picks that up and takes the, takes the lead on getting some things done. We have a great relationship with the Department of Ed uh, because we do a lot of work in um, hands-on, really getting some changes made for higher ed and for K-12. Um, so my report, is, is this long, but I wrote some stuff in at the bottom. And if any of you know me, you know that that's true. Um, so first of all, I wanna say thank you to Braley, Brooke, and Maya. And if you didn't meet them, they're the three people that helped you get in here in the morning. And I remember many, many moons ago when we hosted this at Siena Heights, we got so many compliments from people saying, we had nowhere to go. We, we had no idea where to go. So thanks for putting the students out there. <clears throat> so we've got, one special ed and two early childhood students that were helping you all get in here and they're great girls. So get a chance to say hi to them or thank everybody from um, Spring Arbor for letting them get out there and help us get in here. Um, in higher ed right now, does anybody feel like it's kind of a fruit basket turnover? I mean, I, I feel like it's almost the perfect storm of things happening. And, People are leaving, people are jumping to different places, responsibilities are changing. And I'm not even sure, this is a rayism, so it's not based on anything. I'm not even sure if that's based on COVID. I think some of it's based, I think at least for MACD, I can say it's based on age, time and years of experience, and job changes, job uh, responsibility changes. And so, we have a little bit of fruit basket turnover in Matthew's leadership right now. We are still the workhorse. 
We are still getting amazing things done, but we're kind of in the need for some new board members. If, if my math is correct, which is usually a, a, something you can go chuckle at, um, we had over 12 people said that they, they were new to DARTA. You don't have to be in DARTA or MACD, right? MACD is all, it's a different group that does different things, but a lot of people in here are also on MACD as members. Um, I remember when I came into Michigan in 99, I'm not going to tell you a story from 99 now, but, um, but I was in the state for about three months at Eastern before I was hooked into leadership with, it's now called Shape Michigan. Um, it's the physical education and health education state group. And within a couple of years, I got my feet wet there and I thought, hmm, this leadership thing isn't so bad. It's pretty cool actually, because if you're in higher ed, you're usually not somebody, especially if you're in this room, you're not somebody that's going to sit on the sidelines and just do a, you know, sit and get it. You want to get involved a little bit. And so, yes, in a roundabout way, I'm marketing and promoting getting the leadership of MACD uh, because we need some new board members. We always want new member members, but we need a little bit of leadership help. Bless you. Um, here's one of the reasons why. One of many, and it doesn't even relate to the first part. We have superintendents in the K-12s right now that are getting a, they're getting mixed messages and therefore they're sending mixed messages about some of the things that need to be going on <clears throat> as far as the best routes for our K-12 students that are gonna be in education. And so we have a brand new brochure through Mac. And Tech was phenomenal with this. The whole board got behind her in this. And there's a great, brochure that I will make sure is available to everybody that's going to come out and it's going to be available for you all to see and to use for an explanation of some of the things that are happening. So uh, we're partnering with our tech in the sense that we're getting some good information out, some real information. Um, so we also have continuous improvement. It's been, it's been called HopeCon forever, Doug Rashler. Brand new grandpa for the second time. And if I've done it in enough time, you could have seen his new little one. Oh my gosh. So he's taking on a little bit of a different responsibility as grandpa, but he's also taking on a different responsibility within his university. So he's going to step back a little bit. HopeCon will not be HopeCon anymore. It will still be, maybe we'll just call it HopeCon. We just changed the hope. We're not sure. Um, but Maxie is going to partner with Darta. And we're going to be, um, we have committed as an act team to making sure that that continuous improvement conference goes on, right? So we're looking for someone to host it, because um, it's not going to be in Holland, it's not going to be in Beautiful Hope anymore. And we already had a couple of people who have said that they would be willing to host it. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can talk to me or any of the DARTEC uh, leadership or the MACTEC leadership, if you're interested in hosting that for one year. Um, all right, so here's a couple of the things that we're doing. So you know that we're still on the move, even though our board is moving down a little bit. Um, we're planning a day in Lansing with our students, our future teachers, our K-12ers, as well as our higher ed students. So we're planning a day in Lansing with them to get them some leadership there. We're planning the June retreat in Marquette. Joe Libby has said he'll host it again. <clears throat> and if you haven't been to the Marquette, Summer retreat. Oh my gosh. Raise your hand if you've been. It's amazing. It is, I mean, we go until probably two, and then you're in Marquette. And it's in June. It is beautiful. Um, lovely dinners together, but it's a great time. Of... I'm, gonna say, I'm, I'm not trusting what y'all are talking about. The meetings go until 2 p.m. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Unless you're Sean, and you're at the pub around the corner until 2 p.m. I'm sorry, the restaurant around the corner. Um, so we're doing that. We need a president elect right now um, from a public, and we need a president from an independent, and we need approximately three to four new board members. So that's what our that that is what our fall meeting is going to be primarily about. Doesn't mean if you're a MAC team member you don't want to be in leadership, you don't go to meet. It's still going to be a fall conference. Uh, more on that, I know we're not over. 
So it'll be a, a late fall conference, but we're going to meet with that. Um, we're also, we've taken a back seat for a couple of years since COVID on our dues. Sorry, I'm not going to end on that. Um, so we're, re we're reinstating the dues. Your invoices will be sent to your institutions. Um, it's usually about 300-ish for your institution, depending on how many members you have. Same principle as well. All right. Um, last thing I'll leave you with is something that I said many years ago when I was standing up here for president of DARTEC. It is clear and evident that you all are doing awesome things in DARTEC because we do life better in circles than in rows, right? And Spring Robert, thank you for putting everybody in rows, I mean, in circles. Uh, the conversations that I've seen and I've been a part of already are just awesome. Um, so between these two organizations, it's great to see, and you all need to know that, that life is, is good and, and, and things are really strong in both organizations. So if you're interested to be a part of MACD, more to come. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sally. Georgia, would you come up and talk about Michigan Public Meetings? Sure, since I'm glad seeing you all. Michigan Public Meetings had two formal meetings during the summer. We got everybody together, the talent together, to kind of talk about what were their future goals and try to build a communication so that we're part of the conversation with them, not just hearing what they're doing. And so trying to get more involved with them on that route and find out what they wanted to do. The other major meeting we had during the summer was with our independent partners, universities and colleges here, because there's so much work to be done. And the more we can work together and the more we can collaborate on projects, we think the stronger it'll be for all of the state, all of our students and like that. And so doing what's best for both our college students, but also our K-12 students, by strengthening and building those partnerships. We'll have our first fall meeting, or first meeting for this academic year next week, um, where they will have brand new leadership because I am no longer in a leadership role. Beth Kuczynski is no longer in a leadership role. So we'll be having a meeting and having new leadership in MPEDS starting next week um, like that. But like I said, lots of work. And most of the work I think is gonna be around as we've talked about it during the summer strengthening and building collaborations across a variety of networks. The idea that we can all do our own thing in our own places is gone and it can't come back. And so that's the main theme right now is that greater collaboration. Well, past dark that president showing up here. Um, could you advance the slide one? We don't have uh, a report from my pipe in uh, in the vocal way. We have it online here. I'm not going to read this to you because you all can read. I'll just be quiet. So I think the big takeaway from this is that my pie also needs new leadership. Wow, there are so many opportunities. Yes. yes. Brian, can we can we back up to slide eight, please? Sure. Eight. How far back? Eight. Keep going. Back. Keep going. Back. Keep going. Back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's like all of our work is disappearing. <laughs> there we go. Best practices breakfast. Next time we get together, we'll be at Siena Heights. And Okay, so if this doesn't work, it's all on me because of my wacky idea. But I did go around and talk to people last year, and people seem to be interested in this. When we had the great bands came in, come in, a lot of institutions, I know ours included, said, holy, wow, we have, <laughs> that was edited, uh, we have a lot of changes that we need to make. And we need to meet these new grade band requirements. And some of our assignments and our assessments won't work anymore because some of the standards have changed. This is our opportunity to be stronger together, to share what works. So what we're asking for is bring a trifold, include whatever issue, standard, or situation you were addressing. What was the solution that you piloted? If you've got student work, 
that you can show, obviously sanitizing because you don't want their names on it, um, but share some of that. And if there's a takeaway, bring bring some copies for takeaway or or uh, or get get us a um, you know something that we can share electronically. The way Siena Heights, where we're meeting, we're meeting in a place called Rooker Auditorium, and that has a big atrium before you come into the auditorium part. So there will be tables set up, uh, first come, first serve, get good real estate, near the breakfast table probably. Uh, there will not be electrical outlets, so bring a trifold, okay? Uh, it would be very helpful when you do your RSVP if you could let us know that you're bringing a trifold so that we make sure we have sufficient tables set up. This is our opportunity to collaborate as professionals. We don't get a lot of professional development that's created by this group for this group. And this is one opportunity that's pretty low stress. So I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of best practices. Okay, can you move us back where we were? Hi, I'm Jeff Bean. And um, I wanted to talk to you about the fact um, in March, Dr. Ng sent Holly and I out to Colorado for a wonderful conference or to just get us off campus, I'm not sure which, but um, we went out to the University of... Oh, really? People online have to... Oh, them. I'm sorry. Um, so we went out to the University of Northern Colorado for the National Field Placement Conference, um, which is a chance to talk to people from all around the country who do specifically field placement and talk about the issues and solutions to things that we discovered in that. And Holly, having the keen eye that she does, spoke to me while we were at conference and said, we should do this statewide and provide the same opportunity for people in Michigan to talk about issues that are specific to people who are doing placement in Michigan. So that's what we did. And we created a conference that was attended by many of you um, this August. And I'm gonna let Holly talk about that. For a So we had RSVPs from 20 institutions for our first August Michigan Field Experience Conference. Um, one of the things that was really exciting about the conference is that we asked those of you who replied, what would you like to talk about? It's sort of like having a job alike just for field placement people all day long. So it was really pretty exciting. So from the topics that you had submitted, we then created sessions. And this is what our day looked like. We had presentations about how to work with our field supervisors. We had panel discussions, thanks to the organization of my Ferris colleagues, um, where we had superintendents and teachers come in to talk about working with pre-service teachers. Um, Holly and a reading specialist talked again about a very special program they have doing uh, literacy work, literacy tutoring. And then we had roundtable discussions based on some of the state data that that was given. We know areas that we need to improve in are working with our multi-language learners, our special ed uh, populations, and with the topic of diversity. So we had roundtable discussions centered around those topics. Um, and then recent graduates came. We got to hear from um, people that had just got hired out in the field and hear their perspectives on how their training went, what they liked, what they appreciated, what they hoped for. So that was also a great conversation. Um, and then we heard about creative field placements from NAJ schools who gave us some ideas. So we are going to be doing something similar in about a year. And Holly's going to talk to you about that. Thanks. Can you go back? So I have copies of this flyer, physical copies. So I will pass them out when we get to the job lights. But if your field placement folks aren't here and you would like a copy, uh, you can also just see me and I can give you a copy. So when we finished the day, um, we went, well, what are we going to do? This was a good thing. Now we're going to do. So we surveyed everyone. And the results of that survey showed us two things. People wanted to do another one-day event. So we have that scheduled for next August 2nd. So if you are a field placement person, put August 2nd in your calendar. Because I know some of you weren't able to attend because we didn't give you notice. Um, and then the second thing was that some Zoom um, conversation between those um, in-person meetings and these dark time meetings might also be something. So we're going to try that on Friday, November 7th. Um, and the Zoom link is on that flyer. Um, but now I'm thinking that if you take a physical copy, you won't be able to access that. So we'll figure out a way to share the link to, for people for the Zoom. Um, we also set up a Facebook. Um, and that is not super active yet, but I think it could get more active. 
So you can scan that QR code, it will take you there and you can also join that. So I think we have the opportunity to create uh, a neat place for field placement folks to collaborate, to talk about how to build great relationships with our K-12 partners and how to um, just be best practice uh, folks in our areas. So please come and join us if we're not able to last summer. We can send that Zoom link out through the Dark Tab list, sir. Great. For the November okay. All right. I don't know where this <laughs> Thank you. All right. That was an exciting conference. I'm sure we're going to have much more news. Uh, all right, MBE, who's coming? Sean? Yeah. Are you on deck? Yeah. All right. Sean Cockney, everybody. Let's give him a hand. And all of that. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, first things first, the uh, written updates that went out yesterday. Uh, I can see, because I looked over Paul Johnson's shoulder, that they are on the uh, website, uh, DARTA website already. So if you didn't get it via email, you can go download it today and read. What I have for you, our team has brought, uh, is a sliver of some of the things that are in the written updates. We'll be happy to take questions about anything in the written updates, um, as well as things that we, we speak about today. So we'll go to the, the next. Boy, do we have an active legislature. Um, <laughs> they were already active in April and I saw you last and they've continued to be active since. Um, this is a sliver of uh, uh, legislative updates that we've had since uh, since we last met, uh, so I'm going to read everything on here, but I'll pull out a couple. Uh, the, the 354 on national teacher licensing exam um, hasn't had any action since May. Um, it's like waiting to sit in the education committee. Uh, that is a bill that is the result of uh, lobbying from ETS, you know, the praxis people. Um, we think we have really good arguments why that bill should not move forward. And even if it were to move forward, we have some nice little technicalities that uh, would say, yeah, MTTC, it's, it's available nationally. You could go take it in California if you like, uh, as well as uh, the fact that with our new generation of tests, other states are interested in borrowing from us. So very, very good. So we're, 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 we're very proud of our new generation of assessments uh, and uh, we, we vigorously oppose that bill. Uh, the pair of bills there in the House 5010 and 5011 are on requiring classroom management courses. Um, one of the, if you remember, uh, let's see, the dyslexia bills that have come up uh, over every session, uh, they're things like MDE will not approve an educator preparation institution unless it offers dyslexia training. There are new bills on that, yes, uh, but then these have a similar wording and it's about classroom management courses uh, and of course classroom management uh, professional learning. Um, we are told that we'll be coming to a hearing in the fall. So we're in the fall, I don't know, hasn't happened yet, but it will, I guess. Um, 518 is, is active and moving along, uh, and that is extending the sunset on alternative route programs for special education. Um, that was to expire in June of 2024. Um, it will likely be expanded. I can tell you the results of that bill. There have been about 40, there are 42 new teachers uh, with special education credentials as a result of uh, alternative routes. Um, and that comes to 46 new endorsements. The majority of those teachers, so like all but three, uh, are previously certified teachers utilizing an alternative route to add a special education endorsement onto their certificate. Um, very few uh, new, like brand new teachers getting a uh, special education along with their uh, initial gen ed endorsements. So it's it's proven to be a popular course of action with, with that population of potential teachers. Um, 
lots of uh, lots of bills out there on collective bargaining and retirement and benefits. Um, those are more of an FYI for you. And it, depending on what you do in your senior seminars, if you tell people about what to expect once they're in school, we'll keep an eye on those bills. Um, you can see lots of things here on contracts, school safety. My computer decided to update, so my notes are going to disappear. Um, and that's that's all right. Uh, <laughs> you can click through on our on our DARTEP. Uh, yep. All right. Well, I'll just go backwards there. That's my debate skills from high school. Zip through it. Um, really, the thing I want to focus on are, are PA 110 and 111, and those are unpacked on the next slide. So if we can just go right to those, or I can do that as I just proved. Um, <laughs> well, that'll, they'll come up in this cycle. The budget. So we have another historic level of investment uh, in education uh, from our state legislature. A few things that are in it, uh, the, of course, the Michigan Future Educator Fellowship and stipend administered by Treasury were renewed for another year. Anticipate that that's going to be a continuing thing. And the changes to it in this year's budget opened it up to more people. Uh, so I hope that your candidates are benefiting. Um, we get weekly, um, bi no, bi-weekly updates from Treasury. I've reproduced them in the uh, in the minutes for you, or in the minutes, in the, uh, the written update. Um, that's kind of nice. Uh, you, so you can see how much money is going out. Fewer people are being denied now that uh, those changes have been have been made. So there's a higher percentage of uh, of eligible uh, candidates compared to everybody else. Um, we have uh, grow your own programs. Uh, just continuing to to move round two apps are under review. Uh, Jenny will come up and speak to that in a little bit later, uh, and I hope that wasn't a surprise to her. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the military veterans uh, grant, uh, this has not been at no money, more money has been added to it. And in fact, it was taken out of the budget, but we still have money to spend in there. And as of today, we have still have zero applicants. Is that right, Dante? That's right. Zero applicants for that. Um, there you go. Uh, I thought it would, <laughs> Florida did something similar and, and they had, I think four people four teachers total with a huger, a bigger investment. Um, we thought we could beat Florida. We haven't yet, um, but there you go. Uh, and then certificate renewal uh, application and reimbursements. Now there are a lot of things that are not reported on this slide that are um, designated to specific things. So Saginaw, Val uh, Saginaw School District has a, a, a grant to work with uh, Saginaw Valley State University uh, and the ACR program, then there are two uh, allocations for talent together. Um, but we're just, these are the, the things that affect a broader group of people. And uh, these are either ongoing uh, or upcoming things that our office is for sure uh, in charge of. Um, we have a couple of grants on national board uh, for teacher certification, the one for those who have it, some stipends for those who have it, and then support for those who want to get it. Um, and then there's some extra, there's some language about uh, prioritizing that for people who are in high need schools. So hope that helps with our professional learning. Mentoring and induction, all new. Um, we've got, there's money to build standards uh, for ongoing, for mentorship. Um, to pay mentor stipends and, and costs for training mentors uh, and then for evaluating evaluating the program. Uh, that is in Dante's team uh, and they're they're unpacking and figuring out how to uh, how to work that that piece out. Uh, Rural educator credentialing hub that is uh, for a lead EPI to work with a consortium of EPIs. It's 15 million dollars. Uh, a consortium of EPIs and rural school districts uh, to support uh, no-cost pathway for individuals 
uh, to move from no certificate to certificated um, at, in rural school settings. Um, and we get a lot of get a lot of um, inquiries from rural schools. Of, I've got this person, they're really good. They did everything but student teaching or they student taught but needed a little more extra time on MTTC. Uh, we've got this great para pro. They've got a, they've got a bachelor's degree. How do we get them a teaching certificate? Um, this grant is to create a consortium that will use assessments of non-traditional and experiential learning to and demonstrations of skillful teaching uh, to get those folks to certification. It doesn't waive any requirements for certification, so it's not like. This opens the doors for people to not uh, uh, take MTTC, for example. Um, but it is intended to be this hub. Watch for that to uh, open uh, later this fall. And we'll have more to say on that um, to deans and directors in a bit. Um, there's a bit on special education administrative training, some money for student loan repayments. Um, the a teacher compensation pilot, and then MTTC reimbursements. This MTTC reimbursements is for first time test takers. So we're going to be rolling out that uh, assistance very shortly. We need to work out the logistics of it with uh, evaluation systems. But if you're trying to, but it will be a reimbursement based. So people will have to pay for their test during this fiscal year, so between October 1st and the next September 30th, um, save your vouchers for people who are taking second and third attempts or, or, or multiple attempts. Don't waste your vouchers on first time test takers right now um, because they're gonna be able to get reimbursed. Once we get the system ready, um, it, 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 we have to make sure that people take the test, not pass, but take the test. So. This first round, you know, we're not going to know until a month from now who in October took, who had registered for the test, actually sat and took the test. Um, so we've got some time to roll out the uh, application uh, to do that and work with evaluation systems on making it a clean, uh, clean reimbursement. So, yes. Do you have a time frame on that at all? I know you said it's coming, but. Yeah, well, uh, Bridget's not here. She's in Gettysburg uh, this week. Um, it's for a, a advertisement education policy fellowship program. It's a really fun thing to do. Um, and uh, so otherwise she would be here. Um, it, we should have, we, we got clearance for everything um, from our financial people and somewhat from evaluation systems um, last week. So we would expect by November 1st to be able to publish things on the website. Uh, what we're hoping is we can utilize evaluation systems record keeping um, to tell us who's eligible for a reimbursement um, rather than us looking everybody up because that's a lot of people. Uh, and then sending, um, sending out a, a message to those people who are eligible, you know, click here, apply, and you'll get a refund of what you paid on your test. So, but it's only for first time and it is first time in a subject area. So if you've got a teacher going for a, an additional endorsement in social studies, so the first time taking the social studies test. All right. All right, so PA uh, 110 and 111, uh, clean up some things and I think make your jobs a little bit easier. Um, one is removing that out of state 18 credit hour uh, requirement to get a master's degree. Uh, sorry, a master's degree to get your professional certificate. That was eliminated for in state candidates and in state teachers a long, long time ago. Um, not without controversy. Okay, I get it. Um, but it was taken out, but out of state still had that bar to, to go. So it, it got rid of that. So out of state and in state are, are, are similar. Um, expands the authority for teaching certificates that may be issued by tribes and other countries. Um, so it had been states. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's any test. So you take four subtests for lower elementary or upper elementary. It would be reimbursement of all of those if it's your first time taking them. 
So if you're, if you, you know, if you have to retake anything, then it doesn't, you don't get a reimbursement, but that's where you might want to save your vouchers. So, um, okay. Uh, the other, the thing that was, so of some, but you have more, I don't see it. And so run back. Oh yeah, the the question was about the vouchers for MTTC uh, or the MTTC reimbursements and how that would impact the PK three and the three six with the subtest models, and so yeah, you know, if, if it was your first time taking all of those subtests, you could get reimbursement. So, is there here or or Jane? No, any tests, any tests. Uh -huh. One yes. Yeah. So nothing in the past, and then nothing beyond next September thirtieth. So this is money for this fiscal year. So you could register now, and then, and then not pick a test date for like up to a year. So you don't want people picking a test date after September thirtieth of next year. All right. Any more on that? Those are good questions. Thank you. Bridget was like, don't talk about it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and I did, I did say to my team earlier, you know, the advantage of having fewer people is we can say, oh, I don't know, I'll take that back. Um, but that one I happen to know the answers to. So, okay. Um, on these two bills, on uh, reciprocity, the allowance of three years of teaching uh, on a standard teaching certificate or on a school counselor um, license in lieu of testing, that had been a thing for professional, right? Uh, if you qualified for professional. Now there's a, there's a population, not huge, that would qualify for a standard. So this is not incentivizing people who live in Michigan to go online and take uh, a, a Western Governors program and then apply to Michigan for a certificate. They'd actually have to get their Utah certificate, go to Utah, teach in Utah, or teach online in Utah for three years before they could qualify for that test exemption. So um, it, it's not intended as an incentive for that. It is intended as an incentive to pull out-of-state people back to Michigan and people who may have gone out of state, your graduates, uh, and acquired other credentials, for example. Um, the, the thing that's big and that's why it's bolded for you all is the elimination of that first aid and CPR as a condition for initial certification. Uh, so you don't need to do that anymore. Um, and that is part of the professional learning obligations uh, of the school district in the, the, the teacher's first years. So that should expedite getting people through so you don't have to wait for official confirmation. If you still wanna require it, you can. That doesn't mean you can't, but it's, it's, not, it's not a requirement from the state uh, anymore. And I believe that is, uh, the programming in MoEx is um, is there so that that's you're not having to lie on on people's apps to say yes or no. Um, they haven't. So yes, you, uh, yes, and MoEx has been updated uh, according to my notes. And probably if Kate is uh, not following doctor's advice and is online watching, listening to the meeting, she may pop something into the chat. Um, uh, so, yeah, there you go. That's our legislative updates. Next is, yeah, yeah, Gil. Oh, and then Barrett, Robert. Yes. Yeah, so the question is the bill on classroom management. Um, does it say you explicitly have to have a class called classroom management? Uh, or is it acceptable for an EPP to document uh, that they address classroom management across the course of study. Um, 
it hasn't been passed, right? So it hasn't gone gone too far. Um, our way of of always dealing with those things is allowing for the latter, right? If you can document a course of study that shows you meet, you know, you've covered this in the program, and everybody does it, regardless of whether the course is called classroom management, then then that's acceptable. And it'll be up to us to say to review it. So very similar to. Um, for those who remember when the reading diagnostics requirement came out, we, you know, we sent out and said, here it is. Is it an A class, three credits, or is it spread across multiple classes? How do you, how do you account for this? Um, and there was that great flexibility. And so some of you, Oakland in particular, put together like bunches of programs of study <laughs> that cover it across like a master's degree and others have a single three credit class. So um, yeah, the good question. So three years out of state, is there anything that is tied to their evaluation? So is it a quality three years? Um, right now we have an out of state verification report, uh, that individuals who are applying for Michigan certificate have to take to their employing district, uh, out of state to get signed. And they have to attest that it was a successful experience. Right, a successful experience. Now, that begs the question: What does successful mean? And that's sort of ill-defined. Um, it tends to be defined in terms of time and not being fired. Uh, <laughs> um, but certainly, a district could could say, "No, you are terrible," and and I'm not going to sign this. And we have had that where districts will refuse to sign those forms and submit it. Yes. Will those candidates? Um, they're going to receive a teaching certificate without taking the NCPC, correct? Is that how I understand? Yes, if they have a if they have a valid standard level certificate, so not like an alternative route certificate from another state, and have three years of successful teaching in that state. So then, how does that work? Will they be assigned or attached to an institution and affect the EPP score with the effective rating? First year, year. It shouldn't be because they were they're coming with an out of state certificate. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, if they were your graduate and they left the state and they did a thing and then they came back, they're probably they're already going to fall off of your the the window of people who are accounted for in the score uh, until we come up with a way. Uh, and this would be in Jason's like wish list, maybe uh, to track people who leave the state and in and weave their data into our system. Um, but we don't have that yet. So, yeah, uh, Diane, and then yeah. Is there a time okay. limit for how long you can be away from the state and come back? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. No, okay. no. So this could be a a way to recruit. People who move back to Michigan mm -hmm. and get their teaching license after they have their kids or whatever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. If there's other questions regarding that, my question actually about post bill 4045. Ooh, okay. Uh, you could shoot, but I'll probably have to take that question back to Nadia uh, <laughs> and our professional practices team. Um, so, uh, if I can paraphrase and you tell me if I got it right, looking at the House Bill 40. 40, 45. Okay, so Annika's reading of it is that anybody working in a supervised or unsupervised uh, setting with children must undergo a federal uh, criminal background check. Um, we, yeah, uh, our, our legislative person is not with us today, uh, nor is uh, our, our professional practices people. So we can if if Sarah's noting that down, then we'll get we'll get a response back to what's our read on it and uh, what would be the implications. All right. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Jenny is sitting in the front row, so I see her, so I can't say where the Dickens is Jenny. Um, well, I've been I've been honing that all morning. Uh, come on up, Jenny, and talk and grow your own. Not so bad. Well, surprise, my name is Jenny Dickens. Um, it's nice to see you all here today. Um, thank you, Sean, for that fabulous introduction. Um, I'm very, uh, very pleased to see 
increasingly familiar faces. I'm newer to this position. I'm the GYO um, consultant for MDE. Um, and uh, just to give some of y'all some background on the GYO initiative, because I know there are some many new folks in our group as well. Um, it is a an, it is an initiative to help districts meet some of their staffing needs by supporting their employees um, in their initial or additional endorsements, um, finding a no-cost pathway for that. And it builds on, we're currently in our second phase, in the second round of our second phase. Um, and this second phase, which is for fiscal year 23, builds on fiscal year 22. Um, and this, this phase um, awarded districts um, rather than the individual employees with the hopes that the districts could build GYO programs in partnership with EPPs to uh, design these no-cost pathways uh, to meet those staffing needs. So um, we, as Sean mentioned, we had a historic investment um, in GYO programming, $175 million that was budgeted, 20 million in the state, uh, $155 million federal, um, and all of those funds and more were requested. Um, so we had a uh, first round of announcements of awardees in May. Um, and uh, we are currently in the second phase, as I mentioned, in the second round of the second phase, uh, we got additional applications for our second round, um, and those are currently uh, in the midst of review. So we are chin deep in reviews right now, uh, with many thanks that are going out to our reviewers, um, and we should have some announcements coming in mid to late November, so we'll see. Um, so yes, we had uh, 129 applications the first time and we awarded most um, or pretty much all of the uh, state funds available, about 40% of the federal funds available, which led us to round two. Um, and we had 104 applications there. Um, we are so grateful to all the EPPs who worked in uh, cooperation with the districts to uh, put together some of these agreements and MOUs that were essential to district applications. So thank you all for having a contact available, um, being frequently uh, bombarded with emails, I'm sure, um, from these districts who are working very, very hard to put together these GYO programs. So many, many thanks to y'all there. So all of our updates will be posted to the website. Some is, I feel like a mantra that I'm that I'm developing. Um, but we do ask that you keep your contacts um, in place, that you keep uh, ongoing communication with your district partners for for several reasons. Um, one is because many of them are experiencing dis, uh, changes in their staffing, so they might have um, folks who are shifting districts or who are no longer wanting to continue the program, or somebody that they want to. Put into this program. So they might reach out to you to see about flexibilities or reallocations. Um, there also might be some new MOU requests. We are allowing um, the flexibility to districts to add partners, uh, even post-award. So be on the lookout for that. And um, we also, in this review stage, uh, have found that there are some districts with sort of incomplete partnership agreements. So maybe somebody forgot to sign. Um, so we are considering flexibilities there. So again, for those who have applied and who might need some modifications, they're going to have a very, very tight window. So we ask that you um, especially look out for requests in your email for those modifications if need be. Um, we also ask that you watch for uh, districts who might be using maybe outdated agreements or if there are some changes that they need to be aware of, for example, changes to tuition, um, that you inform them as soon as possible or you communicate with them and update those agreements so that their budgets can be accurate and reflected um, when they submit them. So, oops, here we go. No. Okay. Well, there is another slide in there that I thought I added, um, but we'll send it out via email. It is a request. It is a survey link. Um, we are requesting some feedback from uh, EPPs because what we're doing is we are exploring some options for funding um, that will help bridge some funding gaps for teacher candidates. So especially for recent high school students. Um, for us to devise a, a solid program that bridges some of those funding gaps, we're going to need information from EPPs about credit structure, about um, uh, your uh, agreements that might be in place with um, community colleges, dual credit, dual enrollment. Um, so be on the lookout for that survey. We would really, really appreciate any feedback you have so we can build um, out those opportunities in a way that's responsive to EPP and district needs um, within the confines of, of what we can do. So um, we'll send that survey out. Any questions about GYO at this time? John, can you speak to the experimental programs? Great question. Yeah, the, 
Yeah, Carl's question is, is whether people in experimental programs are eligible to do it. And if I can unpack the question further, um, the first round, the first allocation we got for fiscal year 23 said it had to be degree granting program only and uh, saying about Valley's experimental program uh, is not degree granting um, and so was ineligible for grow your own funding. For this round two, it's the language that's in the fiscal year 24 budget, which took away degree granting. Well, it specified degree granting can mean certification only, which opened up the possibility for uh, Saginaw's program. I know Sherry, you'd ask me like way back, like, well, like all our people are non-degree. So uh, coming back, the, they are now eligible for that. And we try to communicate that out through yeah. the original, uh, that call perhaps. Yeah. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Any other? Questions, feel free to reach out to me at um, mdepme at michigan.gov or just email me personally. I'm happy to take any questions that you have and answer them or pass them along to somebody who can. So thank you all again very much. And coming up is, is Jason Comback here to speak to you on data and you're going to be all the data and accountability unit things today. Okay. So Excellent. there you go. You're lucky you. Kate has prepared me for this moment in time. Uh, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Jason Kambach. For those who haven't, I haven't met yet or are new, I am the face behind a lot of the data that is sent your way, at least as it pertains to the performance management system that we have in place. And just a couple quick notes about Title II for you. Uh, one of the questions I received uh, in the past week is just about when on the um, results analyzer with ES when they will make those worksheets available so you can report your rosters with, uh, coordinate your rosters with MTT, with uh, ES so that they can send the MTTC pass rates to Title II for the next round of Title II. We, I was unable to get a precise date when that will open up. I know last year they opened it up in like late September, I think it was the 27th for some reason it came out, but it still has not been opened yet. Uh, the, the blurb you see there is just what they have on their website right now. It's what they told me over the phone late last week. It's just early to mid-October, it will open up. So if you have not received any emails yet and you're concerned about that, don't worry. To my knowledge, no one has received any emails yet from ES. Uh, other note, uh, one of the comments I usually embed into that DARTEP update is to update your contacts with folks uh, for Title II. And so if you need to update your contacts with ES about who is going to receive those notices about that MTTC roster worksheet, you need to contact ES directly. I have no control over that. That one I can't help you with. I can help you with your Title II credentials. I can't help you with your ES uh, credentials for accessing that system. So the contact information for ES Further Help Desk is in the write-up that was made available to you. It's in there, embedded in there, and also kind of a contact phone number for the help desk if you need to contact ES. Other thing I wanna point out, uh, and I wanted to remind folks, for spring 2024, when you are reporting your, your next round of Title II data, we did wanna make sure that everybody is aware or caught on to a change that Title II made a couple years ago. Uh, this is before my time with MDE, uh, but I am told once upon a time, maybe four years ago, when Title II was collecting your uh, the number of roster, or not your rosters, was collecting your number of completers and enrollees, there were two separate groups. There were your completers, there were your enrollees. You can't double count, so it should be two unique groups. If it's a Venn diagram, it's two complete circles. They don't overlap in any way, shape, or form. About three or four years ago, they changed that where now your completers are a subset of your enrollees. So when you are reporting your number of enrollees, that should also include your completers there. So the Venn diagram now overlaps, right? I point that out because at least those who have a Title II account, you might recall back in May, I emailed out, uh, Dr. Rice was interested in update about what your Title II numbers are. He was doing some advocacy work and wanted to speak more accurately, more up-to-date about what the pipeline looks like. And we were trying to get some numbers. And based on some of those conversations that back and forth I had with a few APIs, it kind of sounded like some folks were still doing it the old way. And then it confirmed, yeah, you, you were still doing it the old way. So just want to make sure that everybody is clear about those changes that were implemented into the Title II reporting system. Right now with MDE, we are doing the state report card. So I actually have some ability to edit those numbers. So if you go back to your office and you realize, oh, I didn't catch on to this change, just let me know. I can make those changes in our end for you. 
real quick, or if you just have any other changes you want to make, uh, let me know. I can get those changes incorporated. I have this nice little edit feature. I can go and make it for you so I can take care of any additional last minute things that might have come to your attention that you might uh, want to correct. Any questions on Title II? The only other thing I will throw out there is that was brought to my attention today that I failed and I had the wrong email address listed in the DARTEP summary update. So in the body, in the main text, I have the, the, the email address for the Title II Help Desk has changed. And so I noted that correctly in the body, in the main right up in the middle. So it's uh, RTI was operating the Help Desk. Now it is finally being transferred over to Triwan. Uh, so there's a new email address. It's still RT, it's still Title II at now instead of RTI.org, it's now Triwan.org. Or sorry, they're not .com, they're not an org, .com, Triwan.com. That is correct in the body, but at the very bottom of that DARTEP summary, there's a table that has just uh, summarizes all the context for you. I did not get that part updated. So just a reminder, emailing the right folks there. I did send a sample email to the RTI old address and I did not get a bounce back or anything from them. So I'm not sure if they're still monitoring it, who's monitoring it, or if they're automatically forwarding it to Tree One. I'm not sure there, but they do have a new email address for you. That's it with Tail Two. And this was just a snapshot of the instructions that they have just to, to support that idea that your completers are a subset of your enrollees. There, I'm, I'm not making it up. And then did want to make a couple of quick comments about the survey data. So the 2022-23 survey data has been distributed. Everybody received that information by, should be by around the end of July. You have that info. If you did not receive your info or you need to update your info about who we send that data to, uh, please let us know. So that should all be available to you. And we did want to make a couple of quick observations for you about that administrator survey. We haven't, uh, that's pretty new. We only did that, I think this was the third time we distribute that survey to administrators. This is a survey that goes to administrators who have some oversight over first year teachers. So recent completers who are in the classroom for the very first time, we send a survey to the administrator of the school building that that new teacher is in. We survey about how this candidate, uh, I guess former candidate is doing and we can get some feedback and we uh, include that in the performance score and we also send that data to you. And I had some time to look over some of the open-ended comments that we had to that survey and we thought it might be worth sharing with some folks. And so for the record, most of the comments are positive or neutral there. So positive comment, this is a great new teacher. Um, more neutral comments tend to be this new teacher is exactly where we would expect a new teacher to be. But we do see about, I guess about 30 to 40 negative comments this time around. And most of those negative comments have something to do with classroom management. There. So we just want to point this out to emphasize that classroom management does appear to still be a need if a student, if a new teacher is doing poorly, chances are one of the critiques of the school administrator is going to be about classroom management. And just for fun, here's some sample comments on the open comments. I removed all personal identifying information from these, but just some comments that we tend to see. There is, tends to be a batch of ones that are just like individual focus where they're specifically about that new teacher. But there are some others where they're just speaking more generally and saying, hey, you know, all new teachers seem to have this problem with classroom management. Maybe it's something that can be developed or worked on during their clinical experiences. And I don't want to leave on a negative note. So to, to Two of the more positive ones for you. I'm not sure this first one's that positive because there's a kind of a backhanded uh, shot at the work ethic of Gen, uh, Gen T at the end of it. But for the most part, you know, these are the more, probably the two glowiness comments that I saw in the open and it question prompts. So I'll just share those with you. And in the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Your question yes. and the answer. Yes. Yes. So the question is about the, with the career technical centers, are they included in the administrator survey? And I'll have to double check that, but our filters for collecting this data, for identifying who to send the survey to, we go to the rep collection, uh, the rep data collection from CEPI that occurs in the fall. And we look at uh, one of the flags in there is like, is so-and-so an MDE teacher? And if that answer is yes, then they get flagged for the school administrator receiving a survey. So I'll have to double check. I guess the question would be if they are, 
if they're in the system as an MDE teacher, then yes, they should be receiving a survey. I'll just need to fact check that. Then just last comment for you, right, is we are prepping for the 23-24 candidate student surveys. The rosters will be sent out to the EPIs on October 16th from Dana, so you can prepare yourself to look for those. And uh, see, when I send out the survey data in the summer, usually I get maybe three to five responses from folks saying, hey, we need to update our uh, your contact list about who you send the survey data to. I forward those to Dana. Uh, but if there's any other changes that you need to make, or maybe Dana and I dropped the ball and she didn't get all the changes incorporated. But if you need to make any changes to your contact list, feel free to reach out to Dana. We'll make sure that we get our contact list updated and we send these documents to the right individuals. When I send out the data to the EPIs, I use the same contact list that Dana has. I ask Dana for a contact list. I use that, and that's who I send the survey data to. And if there are no other questions or comments, that's all we had for you. At least all I had for you. I think Sean has more. Gina, Gina's up next, I think. Yeah. Well, the, there's a, so there is a placeholder slide here for uh, any update on CPAS. So. Jason and, and Gina. I, I was not made aware of so. <laughs> It is uh, assessment and accountability and data. So yes, I, I prepared no talking <laughs> points. So generally, were we going to have the CPAS piloters come up and talk? Was that the plan? Share there. Uh, it is actually updates where they are. What's going on? And what we do with think about? Um, we have some pilot people. Um, sorry, I hear. Use the mic, please, Gina. Yep, I was hoping to stay in the back. I understand. Good morning. Ooh, wow. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the CPAS pilot, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, um, CPAS is a clinical observation tool that uh, came out of Ohio State University, and it is validated on student teachers. So it's um, it's something that we've been exploring. And so we opened it up as a pilot for the state, for institutions who want to give it a shot. And there are a couple of institutions that have been using it on a regular basis across the, the, the state. Oakland and Rochester are two of the big ones that have been consistently you know, getting that into action. And then CMU has been um, really getting that going as well and has some innovation that has been going on there. So come on, let's hear from Jillian. Good morning. Um, so yeah, at Central Michigan University, we have been piloting the CPAS this fall. We started working with our university supervisors in June with an introductory rollout and then followed up again in August with a more concrete training. I would say that for us, the innovative thing that we have done is we have hired a CPAS coach. Um, our CPAS coach is a university supervisor who has worked with us at Central Michigan, but also worked at Oakland. And so she brought a bunch of experience working with the CPAS tool. And so she has been working one-on-one -on -one with our team of coordinators. We have approximately 30 university supervisors across Michigan. So um, it was really key for us to have somebody well-versed in the tool who could meet one-on-one -on -one virtually, who could attend visits, who could coach our supervisors, through the protocol meeting, which is the first thing that you do at the very beginning, walking through the whole process. And now as our supervisors are working at the mid-evaluation consensus scoring, is able to help them prepare for that meeting, help them reflect after that meeting and answer questions that they have. So we've been really successful so far. Um, every Friday, we have a university supervisor teams meeting where we check in with one another for about 30 minutes. And I joined the call as I was driving this morning. Lots of questions about the CPAS, the richness of the conversations that they're having. I know um, some of the meetings are taking approximately two hours, which is more time than my supervisors were prepared for. But because the conversations are so robust and the teacher candidates are getting such quality feedback, the university supervisors are very um, energized by what's happening. So. We're having a lot of success, and our plan is to roll out to special education in spring. Are there any other CPAS pilot people who wanted to jump up and give an update? We had a couple, but I think one other person didn't make it. So thank you very much.
Um, we uh, this is this is ongoing. If you are curious, if you because we have people in our pilot are at various stages. There's like CMU that has it rolling out, and there are other institutions that are still exploring and listening to the conversation. And we have monthly meetings where we all come together and ask, people ask questions, they give updates, and we kind of talk through the challenges. Jason's always there. Um, talk through the challenges of implementing a new observation tool because it's not something you could just slap out there and have it happen. And so, you know, all of these pieces, um, we're just tracking, you know, what are people doing? What are the efforts it takes to, to change to this tool? And then we'll be excited to see some of the results of the tool as we're uh, going forward. Um, if you're curious, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Jason or myself. Um, we're happy to send you a meeting link so you can come and listen to the conversation uh, and just kind of get a feel for what it's like to, to take a look at the CPAS. Any questions? Well, maybe we'll just add that like the door isn't shut if you are interested in trialing a CPAS. If you just want to do anything exploratory with it, I know um, one of our more recent EPIs said they're just going to use it for like a couple of their students and not the entire candidate body. So if you just want to play around with, you know, small sample of your students and see what the difference is between the CPAS and others, you're welcome to do that. So the doors never shut up. We had a uh, Wayne State University recently said they're interested in the CPAS and they're joining the group for the first time. So doors always open if you want to have a conversation with the folks and see what's going on. Yeah, it's just about it. Yeah. I did try to take... Uh, I did revise the slide to take away the little bluebird um, and not replace it with an X, uh, but nevertheless, um, that's follow us on social media uh, and of course get our educationally speaking uh, newsletter. Um, and then I put Q&A here, but uh, we're like sort of right at the, the time where we should be on the agenda. So I don't know. What do we got next? Is it lunch break? It's going to be lunch yet. So if there's any questions. So if there's any Q and A, and then of course we can obviously talk to you while you eat. So uh, Sean, at the end of September, we received the NPPC eligibility verification roster schedule. Yes. There, there. The roster is available Tuesday. This is one example. Tuesday, December twenty sixth, and it's due January second. And this has been happening, and please still get take back. Is, can, is there any way to, to get away from that time frame? Because it seems like many institutions um, do not have people to work. Okay, good. Uh, I can repeat that question. The, uh, they recently all received the MTTC verification roster return schedule. There is a window between December 2nd and January 6th or, you know, 26, okay, uh, which is a, a rather difficult time uh, to attend to that, particularly at a high volume institution. So I can take that back to Bridget and, and yes, and see what we can do about that. Thank you. So back to the laws, 567 and 568, those are the they were just brought up this week. So, yeah. Uh, so, those are the dyslexia ones. Are they oh, yeah. the repeats? Because, you know, maybe that's. Uh, yeah, they're they're you know slightly modified from the last time they went out. Um, okay. Our feedback is the same. Uh, um, um, I feel very confident that should it get passed and into law, we can make quick work of ensuring that it is addressed in our NPPs. And without like putting you all on the list. So, so uh, five sixty-seven is actually for district. Yeah. And they're asking them to have coaches, but not providing funding. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Part of the yeah. So the question was, uh, and was whether they were, you know, re reruns of previous sessions, uh, and whether they are, uh, with some minor changes. Um, and then uh, one particular 567 is a district obligation, but um, funding tied to it. So 
Um, that it becomes part of the whole department's uh, response to to those bills. So we won't comment much on that one in particular, but our uh, our literacy team will have something to say about about that. <laughs> George. Yes, Laura. So when you talk about how um, GYO placement data may impact diversity of placement data for those three part cards. Okay. Yeah. So the, the question is, and I, Jason received this in email uh, yeah. also yeah. about how GYO uh, placements may affect the diversity index in our uh, diversity placement index in our uh, EPI performance score. Um, we're going to monitor it and see. Um, diversity is uh, is framed multidimensionally, so it's not just race and ethnicity, but it also involves uh, socioeconomic status, just language status of students. Um, kind of like when you, you talk about rural, and rural covers like 80% of our state. So um, there are very, very few schools that wouldn't qualify, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't hit one of the thresholds on, on those indicators. Um, so it shouldn't have, and, and it, we may balance out with traditionally. Too. So I, I I don't anticipate them to have a negative. In fact, we will keep an eye on how the data runs. Yeah. Well, there's always that that there's a tension between putting people in a a a school that is a very high need school, but may not be a functional school, and putting people in a highly functioning school. Uh, that may not be high needs. Um, and then there's also the tension between breadth of placements. Say if you're in a, a traditional program for a bachelor's degree, you go to lots of different schools versus say a residency one-year program where you may be just in one school. So those are those are tensions that we hope balance out in the in, in, in the final look, but we, we have to see the data first. The last time we, well, the first time we, we modeled it, I mean, I think everybody got the wrong points for um, diversity and placement. So I, I don't know if Jason you recall, it was very, very few. Yeah, about a third. Okay. Yeah, about a third did you receive full points on there, but received some points. So nobody got like a very bad. Really? Like, I don't think you Okay. So the Jason is for those online, uh, the indicator on diversity of placements is a four point uh, contribution to this. And uh, at, at worst, people had two on that, which is so it's pretty small in the in the overall portion. So, yeah, well, yeah, I know. Re remember that when you complain about students who ask for more points on their papers. <laughs> and I hope all of your student volunteers got some sort of extra credit compensation or. Their extra credit is thank you so much for this first job. Hey, sense of mission. Yeah. You want to say more? Okay. Yeah. No, just while we're talking about the placement diversity calculations. So I have been doing the round calculations for 2024 at this point, and it looks like roughly 72% of all the candidates were placed and will qualify as a diverse school. But just to note that could change a little bit because yeah, I did email out that supplementary uh, placement worksheet to folks. So if you do have candidates who are not at a Michigan public school, so if they were not private school in Michigan, or if they were in a public school outside of Michigan, we don't have access to that data, but you are welcome to give us that data, and I will then include it in the diversity calculations for you. I've got a question from a text, and just asking for clarification. If you're counting the buildings within a district, they have free reduced lunch, while the district at large doesn't have diverse placements. And how does, is it down to the building level or is it at the district level? What's that balance between the two? It is mostly the individual school. Okay. It does vary a little bit depending on whether I, depending on whether I can get data 
for it. So the challenge we tend to have is with uh, early childhood centers where we don't get data for that individual facility. Sometimes I can go into the system and backtrack that and like tie it to an elementary school. So I know like based on the address, it's the same address as the elementary school. Then we just use, okay, we'll use the elementary school. There are other cases where we aren't able to do that, where I, I maybe it's just not available. I can't find the address where it looks like it's a different address, and there's nothing in the you know, database that I can link it to. In those cases, we do zoom up to the district level and use that data. And then I have little notes in the files that, I, that I'm creating. I have little notes of like what I'm using district data, or actually, it has, you can assume it's full data unless I specify it's district data. Thank you for the clarification. All right, then never stand between people and lunch. So uh, there we are. And I pass to you. Thank you, Sean. Mm -hmm. you. Um, just a word of reminder while we're doing this lunch break, make sure you come up and try on one of these things. And the the um the order form is going to show you where the logo is going to be and how cool the logo is going to be. Because the logo is very cool on these things. So I want you to see the cool logo. Um, after lunch, we're going to go, we're not going to come back as a group. We're going to go directly to small groups. And we'll meet, um, deans and directors will be meeting in the room. And Barbara will remind you where that is. And accreditation will be sort of over there. And clinical placement will be sort of over there. And certification will be sort of over there. And you guys will club up and then you'll figure it out. Barbara, do you have some specific directions for lunch? I do, thank you. As a reminder, more than anything, if you do need to use the restroom, I haven't found it yet. Through the double doors to the left, at the rail to the left. Men's room is the first door on the right. Ladies' room is the second door, third door on the right. With respect to lunch, there are two sets of doors we can actually go out so we're not clumping in one area. It is a taco bar. There are gluten-free chips, gluten-free soft shells, and then the ingredients aside from either beef or chicken is very vegetable-based. So there's a salad at the end of the line, and then I believe Gosh, I can't remember the dessert. Outside of there are gluten free cookies, along with the other dessert. They are labeled. And so hopefully, we have met everybody's dietary need. If, as you go through, you have a concern that your dietary need is different than what we've addressed, please say something to me. I don't know what the answer is yet, but we'll have a solution. Enjoy lunch. The names and directors. Talk about a variety of things. Um, start off talking about how each institution, uh, if they pay or provide any kind of compensation to cooperating teachers, it was interesting to see that um, a little bit all, all over the board from uh, no pay, but maybe some professional development sketches to some pay, nominal payments, hundred dollars in some cases to the teacher, in some cases to the district. So um, a, a wide variety there. Also talk a little bit about compensation for um, university supervisors and what's done there, and also found that there was some variety in that. Um, uh, Sean shared some more about the rural educate, educator credential hub, because it, it's RETCH, right, which is a wonderful <laughs> acronym. And so they're going to work on that and see if they can switch it up a little bit. Uh, but it was interesting learning more about that and what they envisioned for that consortium. and. Um, and uh, let's see what else. We also talked about um, the somewhat aggressiveness that we see in some school districts and central ad admin school districts and trying to recruit our teachers or candidates into their buildings um, and sometimes disrupting placements that are already set. And so I have to deal with that and maintain those relationships still with our uh, partners. And then um, finished up with uh, MBE sharing about how they're looking for institutions that might be interested in a small group of institutions that might be interested in um, exploring articulation agreements um, with communities, um, our community college partners. We know we have a lot of those, um, but with the grade bands changing over, uh, there seems to be a bit of a disruption in, in that flow from community colleges to 
the um, EPPs. And so they are looking for, sounds like maybe four or five institutions to, to work with um, initially to come up with some, as, as they phrase it, leak proof uh, transfer agreements for folks, either two plus two or uh, three plus one type agreements. Yeah, I have two pages of notes, so fuck with it. Uh, just kidding. I do. I won't be sharing sure here. Uh, so, in the uh, accreditation and assessment group, we spent most of our time talking about uh, tips, tricks, strategies, lessons learned from Cape site visits. Uh, we have a couple of institutions that have just recently finished theirs up, uh, and several institutions that uh, they're coming right up. So it was really just kind of like a, a brainstorming, problem solving, like what did you do to make sure that people aren't signing in with their personal Gmail addresses when you send the link to their institutional Gmail addresses? Or how do you make sure this document is seen before the, by the participants who actually need to see it? Uh, and we came up with a lot. Uh, so one of the other things that came up is uh, Gina very generously um, generated the idea to put together a Google document, a uh, Google Docs, or Google Drive folder for all of these uh, frequently asked questions and answers to those frequently asked questions and all of these like resources that uh, institutions are willing to share, uh, whether it's just here's how we put together our schedule and our itinerary, we share links to here's the format that we use for, you know, organizing participants, etc. Um, so there was a ton of ideas. Uh, I won't go through them all, but I'll point out one or two that I thought were particularly valid and really worth kind of sharing. Um, a lot of people talk about the importance of kind of distributing the writing of the SSR and the FFR just to make sure that if somebody does leave, if somebody is sick, if somebody has to take leave of absence, anything along those lines, you have people who know how things operate and can speak to those uh, details clearly. Uh, so having, you know, in the case of any kind of turnover, anything like that, uh, you have a lot of people involved, a lot of buying. Uh, Gina also very generously uh, offered herself as a resource to come uh, do visits with faculty members, with staff to get that buy-in so that they know that they're not just um, writing to a prompt, but they're speaking to an entire program and trying to communicate and kind of explain that program to others. Um, we share some strategies about uh, uh, tracking and documenting um, decisions and discussions that happen in less formal settings. Uh, conversations that happen in people's offices that may not get written down in the official meeting agenda. Um, something that I know very, very well. Uh, how do we make sure that those things that uh, people talk about and decide and become part of programs are formalized and noted so that they can be shared as evidence with, with a site team? So we share some ideas and strategies for that. Um, anything else? I think that's about it. Uh, there was a little talk about the new um, AIMS uh, coming out from Cape uh, 2.0. It sounds like the annual reports are going to be, uh, the spring annual reports are going to be for that. And, and uh, there's some excitement that we're not going to be going back in time uh, in 40 years when we log on to like ARPANET to try to upload our annual reports. <laughs> so that's, that's a little joke. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that's coming out in spring, and yeah, there's tons of tons and tons and tons of um, strategies that came up. I'm going to share all those notes with Gina, and she'll make them available to anybody that wants to see them. Great. Testing off more Elvian here. I'm Lori Mauer, and I've been in this position for a year, so I think this is kind of by default. Um, so. Let's see, topic background check survey topic. And uh, we had to figure out that it was Nadia Van, B A N N, is the new Stephanie for background checks, and that Kate would be able to get us in contact with her. And that uh, a civil infraction that is not paid or paid late becomes a misdemeanor. So that's, that might be good information for students to know that. Um, I didn't know that, and I thought, I think that I should tell them that, because that is a fact down, down the road. Um, there was a question about the number of offenses compared to the um, severity, uh, but to always just advise students that this could affect your certification, um, that 
that uh, it's not guaranteed certification, that as certification officers, we supply the information um, that goes to MBE for certification. If I'm saying anything wrong, please stop me. I'm, I'm like, seriously. They do. Um, more about background checks. So let's see, background checks. There is Castle Branch and Selection.com. And um, Selection.com is, is one that others don't know about. And that we must a quarterly check. And it will notify you um, if there is something that changes. So um, that's another option. Uh, there's a request for telling us what we actually like should be doing. More specifically on that, um, referring to HB 4045, that it was very hard to like dig through the legal document and that if we could have some clarification on what we should be doing, that would be awesome. I don't know where that clarification would come from, but that would be great because it's hard to read and figure out what it's talking about. Okay, background checks. Put that written in the left. That's actually. Oh, Jenny Dickens talked about grow your own. And um, so there was a lot of conversation about that. And she's in the back. I just like it. And then we have, um, so we'll talk about MTTC. So that came up several times. Uh, there was also a request for it in writing, uh, what will be reimbursed and what the timelines are and for, for specifically the test. And there was a comment about communicating to our students by September 30th, 2024, that it might be different the following year. You might not get reimbursed. Like, so it's, I guess it's just one of those things where some something in written, which is probably coming anyway, but that's just a request. So let me know again. If this is all thank you for not. <laughs> all right, next thing. Um, we're still talking down to two things. Um, let's see. that we need MTTC resources. Um, there's a lot of dependence on faculty to to work through or to work with the student. Um, there's also a question about in the last um, newsletter about how you could get access to certain questions or practice tests um, if you were in sort of some sort of committee and I'm correct in saying this. Um, and, and so I personally um, wondered about uh, equality and students getting those uh, resources if you could only get them if you were involved in the committee. Um, and if there was one school where uh, they had the faculty had um, content area modules that they developed for students to do. And that was mainly the places um, where, like, it was the social studies and education was their bread and butter. So they had, they were highly motivated to um, come up with ways to help students. But there's a lot of um, weight on professors and not a lot of resources. So the request for more resources. Um, You can see again uh, about an upcoming MTTC administrator test, estimated timeline. What does that look like? There was a request for that. I just feel like I'm out here asking for things. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, let me go back to Yeah. 
Yeah, Christmas before Christmas. I want this. Yeah. All right. Michigan Fellowship. Does MDE have a tracking system that um, teachers are tracked to see? Um, are they actually in school? And um, I guess that's a treasury question, according to Jenny, that that's not really an MDE question. Um, but I was not aware that there's a 0% loan over 10 years if you don't teach in Michigan. That's an awesome deal. Um, and that it's prorated if you don't get to like the number of years that you're supposed to get to. Um, I saved the best for last. Um, there are more students successful in the sub test than in the test 103 from the experience of the group. Uh, breaking it down into smaller pieces was better for the students, got that from the group. And everyone is completely elated with no requirement of first day CPR. <laughs> so that's it. All right, from the clinical placements, we talked about mentor teacher training and what our various um, EPPs do. We also talked about background checks and what each of our EPPs do. Um, we discussed supports for early field placements. Actually, it was more of a discussion on um, how we're trying to meet all of the new requirements for those early field placements and what we do with those, how we're trying to track those. And um, we discussed mentor teacher stipends and actual remuneration for all sorts of things beyond swag. And also had a very interesting share out um, and got asked for guidance on inappropriate social media posts, which had a student removed from a placement. So. Oh, why don't you find you guys? Oh. I'm sorry. Thank you very much to all of our reporters. So, um, did you have something you needed to say? Yeah, come on over. Thank you. Um, Paul Johnson from Wayne State University. Uh, we are working with Nadia from MDE on a survey about criminal history background checks. We're, we're going to release the dark at the search. So, It'll be a full track survey. So we don't we don't have to respond through email and fill up the our checklist circular with responses. Those that complete uh, the survey will get a response uh, or all the responses. So you can see what uh, is going on in other institutions. We're interested in uh, how background checks are done, the frequency, the costs, and then now he has um, a few questions as well about processes. So uh, that came up in some of the reports today about background checks, and we, we just want to learn what everyone is doing and see if there's some best practices out there. So, so when you see that um, that release, if someone at your institution could fill that out, like one person per institution, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, we're going to move into the next or hopefully final part of our our program here today. Stein is going to take us through. Some information about AI. So before I get into the presentation, for those of you who came up and did a report out, if, if you could just send me uh, a bullet point list of those things, because I neglected my duties as um, secretary and I didn't capture anything. Uh, so again, first name Stein, last name Brunvan, not to be confused with all the other Steins in your contact list. Um, so it would be great if you could just capture that for me. So, um, as you probably know, I'm Associate Dean College of Education Health Human Services. Um, I also, as a faculty member, teach in uh, learning technologies. Well, I've not been teaching since I've been serving as Associate Dean, so I do miss it. Um, and then I've been serving as an ISTE AI Explorations Faculty Fellow for uh, the past five or six months. And um, so I also acknowledge the fact that this is the last thing on the agenda. And um, since I'm interested in learning technologies and things like AI, this may really only be interesting to me. Um, but I'm going to try to get you to your weekend. So a quick brief plug. As part of this um, AI exploration, which is funded by GM, 
Um, it's, uh, it, it's made up of, there are seven of us as fellows from around the country, and we presented at the history conference this past uh, summer, and we're planning a virtual workshop on November 1st, and there's an email that I got sent to go out to all of you, I think I sent it for 2.15 today, and so if uh, the scheduling email feature in, in Gmail works, then you should get it right about when this presentation ends. Um, and so that's, as you see, it's from six to nine, um, and as part of the grant that GM provided, they have stipulated that this workshop, uh, initial workshop, is for faculty of EPPs uh, only. I, and I, I don't mean to exclude anyone that's not a faculty member or our pre service candidates, but for the initial um, workshop, that's what they're asking for. We are capping it at 100 people. It's online to try to keep it manageable and also useful. We they need to do that. So if you're all interested, make sure you um, sign up for that or share it with colleagues who might be interested. So AI, um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, AI. There's so many things we can talk about as far as artificial intelligence goes. Um, and hopefully you'll find some of this useful, but a half hour is not nearly enough time really to delve too deeply into this. I know on the Dearborn campus, um, I'm on a task force for generative AI. There's a three campus um, committee between Ann Arbor Flint and Dearborn um, that put together about an 80 page report on generative AI in particular. So I'm sure there are discussions going on on your different campuses. Um, but a couple of things to point out. First of all, that chat GPT is not the advent of artificial intelligence. Uh, this has been around, AI has been a thing uh, since the 1940s. Um, and we all uh, have likely used AI, maybe used AI right now, maybe used AI to get here, to help us find our way. Uh, and so it's not as if this is something that just Came upon the scene when Chat GPT was announced. Um, but we use the things like chatbots, social media, uh, writing email and have spell check or grammarly or autocomplete voice recognition, Siri, Alexa. Again, like I said, um, uh, we probably ask for directions on the way here. So we use it in our everyday lives. Um, and I think it's important we think about where it might fit in teacher education preparation programs. And it may fit different places, it may fit several different places. Um, so is it in methods classes? Is it something that we say, well, that's just what we talk about in our ed tech classes, our learning technology classes. It doesn't fit anywhere else because of course, students aren't using it anywhere else except for the technology classes, right? Um, content area classes across your curriculum. Is it part of in-service for folks, PD, graduate course? And you might've guessed the answer to that, I think can be all the above. Right, it, it has a place everywhere. Um, and, and so it's important to think about how it might fit in. So let's let's talk a little bit about generative AI, this idea uh, of things like chat GPT or um, Dolly, uh, and Bard, all these different things we've heard about where it's literally generating content. And uh, this is all, you might've heard um, the, the term large language models where you have this massive amount of information that's been put into the system, and the system then tries to spit out, and I'm really simplifying this, the system tries to spit out coherent content based on what you're inputting. Um, and, and recently, uh, ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI announced that there are, they are expanding to multimodal capabilities so that you could enter things, not just text, but you could put a picture into ChatGPT and ask questions about the picture, right? So one example I heard was, Here's a picture of my bike. Please tell me how do I raise and lower the seat? And it would then create a, a diagram with an arrow pointing at here, switch this lever, and then you can raise and lower your seat and things of that nature. So it's moving beyond just text, but where we can put text in and we can get, we can put a prompt in and we can get something back out based on that prompt. This is a picture that I created. Uh, isn't it beautiful? Uh, and I created that. For, hey, thank you. One, one plus one. Okay, for the record. Um, I'm not an artist, but isn't that, it's just beautiful. All I did is I went into Dolly uh, 2, and I said, um, give me a picture of a river in an impressionist style. And that's what it painted, right? So uh, you can imagine what artists feel about this, right? Because I could have said in the style of Van Gogh or Picasso or whatever else. Um, I could say to ChatGPT, write me a rap song in the style of you know, fill in the blank, and then it would it could start writing something for me. Um, so there are some real concerns about generative AI. How do we define authorship? How do we I, I, um, how do we determine? Uh, I don't 
have it up here, but how do we ter determine cheating? What does cheating look like, right? If we're using these tools and how do we pinpoint it? Um, and I won't even get into how do we catch students, right? Because if you've got someone that comes to you and tries to sell your institution or buy this product and you'll be able to, you'll be able to catch anyone that uses chat GPT. Another option would just be to take money and throw it out the window if you want to do that, okay? Because they're, they're, we're not able to check accurately and say, this person used generative AI, this person didn't on this paper, right? So it's it's kind of uh, a fantasy to put on your syllabus uh, that chat GPT is not allowed. And how are you going to stop people from using it? Um, data security, right? So when you're entering prompts, you're giving the system information about yourself, right? And, and so far, there's not real clear guidance on what has happening with that data that's being collected, right? And our students need to understand that. Um, guarding against biases. So these large language models have all of this data poured into them, right? And so they're going to spit out what's put into them. I had a colleague mentioned to me that she did a search for the top five children's authors. Um, please tell me the top five children authors uh, of all time. And she got a result of the five white guys. Now, I, I find it hard to believe that that is completely accurate. I mean, there's that's it. Just just five white guys are the are the, are the top authors of children's books, right? Not really expansive. And so, uh, guarding against those biases, um, verifying accuracy in the world of generative AI is referred to as hallucinations. This is different from the hallucinations that you might have experienced when cannabis was legalized in Michigan, right? Completely different kind of hallucination. Hallucination basically are it's fabricated stuff. You probably heard the story about the lawyer who submitted a you know a brief and then got nailed for five thousand dollars or whatever it was because it's fabricated. Or I've had people tell me stories about how they decided to try to generate a um, literature review just to see what would happen. They got a great list of references, uh, and a third of them were completely fabricated because what can happen is tools like ChatGPT, and I'm not just trying to slam that particular tool. Um, but tools like that can take real information, signed run man, real person, uh, and in an area of research, gamification, I've, I've published in that area, and a journal that actually exists, that maybe I've even published it. So three actual facts, and then create an article that does not exist, okay? That is, that I've never published, that's never been published anywhere. But it lists a real person on a real topic in a real journal. The only thing that's fake is the actual reference. So then when students go to the library and say, I've searched everywhere for this, can you help me find it? They say, it does not exist. That was fabricated. That's a hallucination. Um, the cost. There is a, a, a significant cost. Uh, University of Michigan has come up with UMGPT. Um, and initially, it is free use. But uh, in order to sign up and use it, you have to enter a short code. And they get to tell us how much it's going to cost when it actually starts costing money. So we can understand that people are all hesitant to try to use it. But there is a cost involved and the environmental impact. Um, much like you may have heard about with um, things like Bitcoin, and, uh, the, the, the amount of cost in data mining that goes on running these servers uh, in water to cool things and just the energy. Same thing with uh, anything running that generative AI type of technology. So there are lots of uh, things to consider there. Um, so, but I want to talk a little bit how we might start to harness generative AI um, in, in the work that we do. Um, so one area that we, uh, we probably need to uh, learn some skills in is prompt engineering. And what I tell people is, imagine you're talking to a teenager. And I don't mean to disparage teenagers. I was a teenager once. Many of my colleagues, most of my family members would argue that I'm still kind of like a teenager, but I'm working through it, all right? So if you've ever asked a teenager who's come home from middle school, high school, how was your day? Right. You got the response. That wasn't a grunt. Okay, fine. One word response, right? The problem was not the teenager. The problem was the prompt, right? You didn't ask a good question, right? Instead of saying something like, hey, I know you've been studying real hard for that math test you had today. How did that go? Now, they might still say fine, but you've given them a context at least, right? And so when you think about prompt engineering and when you're putting a prompt into chat GPT or another generative AI tool, 
You want to provide some context, some constraints, anchor it in something, maybe take on a role. Um, I am a, a, I'm a poet and I want to write a poem in this style about this topic, right? So give it some context um, and cr or create a task, right? And so this is something that um, to think about if you're using these types of tools, and it could be something to help our students think about as well. And I know I've got some colleagues that will say, well, I'm not going to share this with my students because it's basically telling them how to cheat, right? Well, that's one way to look at it. But we can also structure assignments in a way um, that maybe helps them use these tools for positive purposes. So one way that I've been using it with my, my colleagues is in curricular redesign. So we've been going through redesigning in particular our master's in educational technology and our, our bachelor's program in educational technology. And so we will go into um, chat GPT in this case and uh, ask for a program description for a master's program in instructional design and learning technologies and see what it spits out. Now, what's really helpful about this is that because we have some background in that area, we can vet what it provides us, right? And look at it and say, well, does this make sense? Does this work? Or is this close to what we had for our current program? How is it different? What do we like, what we don't like? And so we're able to kind of interrogate what it provides, the content it spits out to us. It also speeds up the process, right? And I, and I first, I don't feel lazy using a tool like this, much like I don't feel lazy in driving my car here instead of walking here today, because it's a more efficient way to get here, right? So we, we could come up with these program descriptions. We did the same thing for course descriptions. We can come up with those things, but it helps speed up the process. Is all of it wonderful? No. Does it usually need to be edited? Yes. But in about 10 seconds, it spits out some ideas for us to work with that really helps speed up the process. So it's worthwhile for us. Um, likewise, in our teaching. So there are different tools out there, specific tools out there um, that are generative AI, not just chat GPT, that you can enter in and say, I want a lesson plan, or I would like a quiz on the Civil War for eighth graders, or I would like, and, and it will spit it out for you. I would like a PowerPoint presentation to teach about the solar system, right? And it will provide something for you that, again, you can edit and refine. So one example is the lesson plans. Um, and so one way we can think about using this with our students is to tell them, I want you to use, I'm telling you to use generative AI to create a lesson plan. I know a lot of teachers, there are a lot of the students that we work with, they go out to districts and they say, they, they're providing us with curriculum, they have lesson plans. You tell me I have to write a lesson plan and I go teach here and they tell me, here's the lesson plan, don't write it, follow it, don't deviate from it. Okay, so why are you teaching me how to write a lesson plan? Well, it's important to learn those components, what makes up a good lesson plan. But where the rubber really hits the road is when you actually implement the lesson plan, right? So using generative AI to ask important questions to help them refine a lesson plan can be useful. So here's some uh, example, and I know it's gonna be hard to read this. This is a screenshot because I'm not so brave to jump into chat GPT right here in front of all of you and, and pray that it works properly. So I did this in advance and took some screenshots. So my first prompt was design a lesson plan about the solar system for third graders. Now I will tell you, it's a, it's a session one objectives, session two. It actually gave me about nine sessions. It would have kept going if I didn't stop it. And each one is basically like a day's lesson, right? So I started reading through it. Okay, we're gonna draw, we'll draw pictures of the, of the uh, planets. All right, not bad, okay. Um, this is somewhat useful, but I wanna narrow, I'm gonna drill down a little bit. So I said, provide ideas for differentiating instruction for students at different levels of ability. Okay, so again, this is one through three and it gave me about eight or nine things, right? So now it's talking about, well, you could use tiered assignments, you could use flexible grouping, varied resources, and it's starting to narrow things down a little bit forward based on my prompts. Okay, that's useful, that's useful. But I know that my students really like hands-on learning. So I asked another question. Add more hands-on learning opportunities to this lesson. And what's blocked at the top here by the Zoom stuff is, I love the little responses where it says, sure, I'd be happy to add more hands-on learning, right? And so then, <laughs> here we go. Again, here's the first five out of about 10. So things like create a scale model, moon phases. I like this one because it involves Oreos. Help them observe and like, yeah, use cookies to make the moon phases. That sounds delicious. Um, 
planet fact cards, planet art projects, solar system mobile, right? Now, as you look at this list, you, you might think, well, yeah, okay, duh, those make sense. I could have come up with those. I'm sure we all could have, right? But again, in a matter of seconds, it comes up with these ideas. And now what's important for our uh, pre-service candidates is to be able to look at them and think, okay, what do I know about the students that I teach in my classroom? Which of these will work? Which of them won't? How do I have to adapt them? Maybe I want to ask a question about working with ESL students, because I know I've got a lot of second language uh, learners in my classroom. Maybe there's some, uh, I want to continue to ask some more questions to drill down further to get some more specifics, okay? I don't have a problem, personally, me personally, I'm not speaking for you if I'm your board or anything else, it's me personally. I don't have a problem with students using generative AI for something like this. I don't feel like they're cheating the system, right? If, if they turned around and, and submitted a lesson plan where they copied everything from this and said, I wrote this all myself, well, I mean, that's another story, right? But if I've structured the assignment where I'm telling them, go to generative AI, I want to see the prompts you use to narrow down a lesson plan that will meet the needs of your students. And I want you to tell me why you use those prompts. Why are those, why are those important things to ask? And which of these did you pick out and use and why? Why do you think it's a good idea to do planet art projects? What about that? Fits with your students and with what you know about them. That's, in my opinion, that's what's important, right? And not so much, did you come up with all these ideas on your own? They don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? They need to understand the needs of their students. So here's a technology that can help speed things up and provide some ideas, some of which may be terrible and some of which may be great. Yeah. It sounds an awful lot like a Google search that we're doing already. Is, yep. this, is the parallel the same? Yeah. So the Google search will, will result in web pages that may have lesson plans that you could download, right? And this is this is going to be more responsive to the specific questions you ask, right? Um, it's if, if you haven't used Chat GPT, it's a little disconcerting, right? You, you put in this prompt and it starts just Letter words start appearing on the screen. It reminds me of, uh, you know, Matthew Broderick and, and the, the War Games or whatever that would be. Yeah, you know, do you want to play a game? You know, type of thing. It's it's kind of freaky, right? How conversational it gets, and you start to think that's a real person talking to me. They really get me, right? And um, so I wonder if they want to hang out later today. Yeah. So there are movies about that too. It doesn't end well. Okay. Um, so. There's a, there's a lot to think about. There, there are all sorts of ethical concerns, um, all sorts of things to think about. I mean, I just provided one example of how you might use this and how students might use it, um, but you can think of all sorts of evil ways that, and we've heard it too, that uh, students can use it to you know, cheat the system and everything else, right? Um, but I think it's one of those things that it's, it's only going to continue to evolve. Um, if open AI also just recently uh, introduced ChatGPT Enterprise for use in the workplace, whatever that might mean. Um, so it's not going away, right? So I, if, if you've got any you know, thoughts, questions, anything you want to toss out right now, feel free. Um, but this was intended more to be just, let's dip our toes a little bit in it, get to think about it a little bit, and we do continue these conversations. There's a workshop uh, that I mentioned um, that will go a little bit deeper into this. I apologize because you, you might hear a little bit of things that I've shared here right now, but to go into deeper um, thought about it, um, I you know, welcome you to uh, join that workshop. But anything anyone wants to toss out, I'm curious how many, just if you're willing to share, how many of you have used chat GPT or something like that at least once? Uh, and it's interesting that a little bit of research we've done with students on campus at Dearborn, um, their thoughts about whether it is cheating or not directly correlate to whether they've used it or not. It seems like the students who haven't used it say, well, it's cheating, and I would not stoop to that level, right? Uh, and those who have used it say, well, it's, great, it's a great tutoring system, right? When I have questions about advanced physics, I can go in there and ask it, and it will break it down for me, because I can ask it, explain this theory for me in, in a way that a uh, freshman in college might understand it. And he can start to break it down for me, right? So, it, but it's also interesting to see how, um, how, how few 
uh, of the students have actually used it. We have this perception that they're all using it, they're all cheating with it. And the, the statistics don't bear that out really, actually. Yeah. yeah. One of my faculty had a student who, um, she was concerned that she had used um, chat B just because of the language that was presented. So if it was not the way the students communicated, it wasn't like, she didn't even know how to pronounce some of the words. And so she ran it, it was a checker that she, um, it was an AI checker. She ran it through and it came up, 84% of this is AI generated. And then she thought, well, is that true? So she took another one and ran through it and said 90% of this is human generated. So, um, so of a different, I mean, a different paper. So it was like, so she felt like, and it was just a, um, a the cue book for her was the student could pronounce some of the words that she was using and it wasn't really her normal writing style. And so um, she thought she, you know, like we have other papers you can run through um, to check for all your, you know, citations and stuff. This was a, she did find something online that actually ran through it and, and it was pretty accurate. Yeah, it, it, I think it's this, there are going to be a lot of conversation like conversations like that with students where I have reason to believe that you didn't write this because based on the first three pieces of writing you turned in, this seems to be significantly more advanced, uh, your use of language, vocabulary, whatever. And it can be difficult just to just say, no, I didn't, I wrote it. I wrote it. Prove, prove that I didn't write it. Okay. Um, I've got this checker that says, but okay, well, point to where I plagiarized that from. Point, point to the content that I copied. Which of that is mine and which is not mine? Words, you know, it's, it's become very difficult. Well, it, what was good was that the student read it and didn't know how to pronounce some of the words that she wrote. So, yeah, that should be a clear indication of something, something in this. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't mind the AI of the it's the create, it's the killing of the creativity of um, um, Just recently, I was reading that uh, there was a contest uh, that people submitted short stories and that. And they had to shut it down and just close it because they got all of these, they, they received an influx of submissions, but they just seemed to be like AI generated. And, and with regard to AI and how it just kind of gleans information of the information that's already put, we get into those Google and you know, that type of things because it isn't really that creative thing. It's just pulling from all these other different resources to come up with something that it can piece together. And being me, being a writer and doing all that, and knowing an artist and things like that, that's the big concern in that people invest all of this and that people can just go out and create it like that. And for, for me, I like to look at the larger picture that kind of seeps into a society, you know, it's education, it's just a society at large, that people who are entitled, they think that they can just do these things, and they got really you know, thought into it, but then claiming that it's their own thing work. So that's where my concern is. My concern is more of a humanistic kind of thing. We as human beings, you know, yes, the technology is great, but I believe it no matter what it is, it, there should be a balance. And I'm not seeing that balance. I'm seeing a whole lot of, this is AI, and this is great, and it can do all this thing. But we're human beings living amongst and with and using um, these advancements and technologies. And the further we move into that, the less of an importance I see is, you know, human beings and the, and the things that they create um, are given. Yeah, yeah, and that's a big concern of the, the, the writers, the current strike that just recently got resolved, that our jobs are going to be replaced because AI is going to write all the jokes, write all the scripts, write, write everything for TV, movies, and everything else. And there's, it's a real slippery slope to go from what, what I would consider this example I shared as far as a lesson plan as being using it as a productivity tool, right? Because you can certainly insert your creativity into a lesson plan about the solar system. Yes, okay. But it's also helpful to rely on what's already been created and thought of out there to, to, to make it work. But it's a slippery slope to go from this is such a great productivity tool, it helps me more, be more efficient to the creative side of things. Now, write a novel about whatever the case may be and, and have it generated for you 
without taking any time to express your own creativity. And that and that's a real concern. That's a real. Um, it, it doesn't take long before you veer over into that area, and, and that's something we need to be conscious of. Well, with regard to that example, I mean, I know AI is trying to implement it's not worsening, where the, the problem with AI generated stuff is it doesn't have those qualities of human beings that are smooth, so that's how we can spot AI. And so they want to incorporate worsening, which is uh, where they where they incorporate human human aspects of emotion and, and, and jagged conversations. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, restate re or rephrase what you left on mind. That okay, so the, the idea that um, AI is trying to become even more human like from what you're saying, because because you can you can oftentimes detect AI based on the fact that it lacks that human human esque quality to the writing, and so it's kind of scary to think that they're looking to I don't know if we call it advance AI further to make it even more human like. Uh, in the right way. Is it? Yeah. I went back in conversation about this. Um, at the Down University, we're actually having this kind of same conversation at Capital Um, with all the things that are together. But I, uh, I'm just wondering if your committee would kind of consider the way um, in which discriminatory AI can be thinking. Um, like we talked briefly about hallucination. You know, tech and things that are factually incorrect, but if a student can identify a hallucination or a background can understand um, that, like, for example, a DC type of systemic racism document, uh, how would the committee address that? And I know this is on a on a greater scale, like society wise. We've got issues of these, these Gen AI, these Gen AI chatbots. Uh, you know, there's evidence to show that the more you feed them that phrases or sexist or creepy, the more they form that opinion and then that's what they write and act as the gen they act. So like it's it's a really exciting technology, but like the can of worms, and I know we talked to all this about a lot of work in scenarios, um, that can happen because so much of what we operate on, we're not just, you know, vetting this is truth or or false. It's it's embedded in this kind of long lineage of, you know, this is, this is wrong because, and, oh, I didn't know that it was wrong because I didn't know about that, you know, X factor based in this part of history until I learned about it in this class at my university. So I just, it is a complex issue, but I, I worry about, you know, students and faculty going in and you know knowing that they've corrected all of those mistakes but over the factual correction for the hallucinations but not aware that they are um reinforcing things that you know we're deliberately trying to construct as faculty um perceptions of people perceptions of race perceptions of like you know identity um and how we can i, I just wondered if the committee has addressed that or you know, anybody else at any university talks about this? Because it's, it's, it's a really complex topic. Yeah, we, so question basically about how do we address um, the, the inherent cultural biases and other, and other types of biases that are that are in AI and the content it spits out and how we make sure students are aware of this. And unfortunately, um, these different biases have been part of the textbooks we teach with, uh, uh, you know, with other materials, um, just the the filter bubble that we create around ourselves with digital technologies on the whole, social media and everything else, it's designed to narrow um, the content that is sent to us based on what we like and retweet, right? So we are actively involved in narrowing the scope of information we get sent to us, basically. And so um, helping students be aware of that, that if, if you are only um, liking or commenting on certain types of stories, you're going to see more of those stories, which are gonna confirm for you, reaffirm for you that, well, what I'm thinking must be right, because look, all these stories uh, basically uh, support that. So there can't be a different opinion that I'm not thinking about because all the news fits with what I think. And that's very dangerous, right? And so understanding 
the, uh, the those filter bubbles that we create around ourselves subconsciously in some cases, but then also understanding that again, much like uh, the, the textbooks that are available and other material, digital print, there are those biases, and we need to pick that apart and think about it and and be very aware of it because uh, we don't want to be inadvertently perpetuating those biases, and, and so having those conversations is is very important. Yeah. I would just like to ask sort of a follow-up question on that. I know you talked a bit at the beginning about how when you ask ChatGPT to pull up, let's say a lit review, some things will be hallucinated and then some of it might only be from white men, especially if it's in science. Um, is And that's going to play into some other things. And of course, textbooks are normally biased anyway. So are we thinking about having standards and like specific ways for communicating that to our students? Um, or is that just like a... No, I think I think that's a great idea to come up with come up with a set of practices to help and, and, and strategies to help students not just talk about, hey, so this biasy thing is a, it's it's something to be aware of, but how what are strategies that we can utilize to guard against that and to minimize that impact? Yes. One thing I would yeah. just like to add is having worked with tools like this in the past, it is really good to have a threshold of okay, I am only getting this percentage of women, this percentage of people of color, this percentage of whatever kind of information and having those things makes it much easier to evaluate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very good. All right. Cool. What is it Yeah. Oh, good. Angela, I mean, this is good. Do you foresee a time that you know, I read, we're going to retreat from practices of I'm showing my age now, the old new book, essay book, you know, with the lines on it. Um, and my son's a sophomore now in college, and he has the face in his classroom, so I wrote a proctor to watch him take his test. Are we going to start right now? Are we going to see possibly a time where a uh, brick and mortar environment is held in a higher esteem because maybe perhaps students are producing products that are being evaluated that they know aren't generated by AI versus online? Do we see, we see that happening in the future? Okay, so the question was do we foresee uh I don't want to call it a reversion because that sounds negative, but uh, a a pivot back to more of an analog uh world, uh, more of an in-person uh type of situation. Uh, ironically enough, um we at the University of Michigan got to experience that at the start of this fall semester when we completely unplugged from the internet due to a perceived cybersecurity threat. Uh and so yeah, okay, well, it's much appreciated. <laughs> Literally, uh, uh, good, good to hear. Yeah, 145 on Sunday afternoon, the day before class has started this fall, a message went out saying there'll be a temporary interruption to the internet. Uh, we will get this resolved as soon as possible. And we had internet back by that Wednesday. So, no Canvas, no online, any, anything online whatsoever um, for a couple of days to start this semester. So, we um, we were walking with jump drives and people's PowerPoint presentations, putting them on the computers in the classroom so that instructors could pull up their PowerPoint. Um, anyway, so I, to answer that question, personally, I, I don't, um, just from our experience from uh, students coming out of COVID, as we've been trying to move back to more face-to-face, -face, and Dearborn, we're a commuter campus, we don't have any housing, so students come to campus to go to class generally, and if they don't have class, then they don't come to campus that day. And so um, they're perfectly happy not coming to campus if they don't have to. And so if we were to say, hey, we're going to move back to um, more face-to-face, -face, or this is an online class except for the exams or except for these assessments, you have to come in and be in person or something of that nature, um, I see us losing the enrollment. So I guess if we all 100% decide to do it together, because then we wouldn't lose the students to each other, um, maybe, but I, personally, I don't, I don't see us being able to move the needle back that way. But I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Stein, and thank you everyone who's been able to stay. And thank you, a big thank you to Barbara and the folks at CMU. I, we need to give them a big round of applause. Barbara, did you have anything else you needed to say? Okay.
But thank you again for allowing us to host today. It's been a phenomenal day. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will see you in where? Yeah. Yeah. Avery, Michigan at CNIT, Michigan, December 1st. Yeah.